Hello and welcome to the Edupedia world. In the last session of the lecture on sexual reproduction in flowering plants, today we shall discuss about double fertilization and post fertilization structures and events. But before beginning with the new session, let's have a quick recap of the topics learned previously. Earlier, we have thoroughly discussed about the structure of a flower, its various parts, the male and the female reproductive parts, the accessory parts of a flower like calyx and corolla, and also we have discussed about the variations in the structures. So here, as you can see, it is the structure of a complete flower, also called a perfect flower, a bisexual, or a hermaphrodite flower. A complete flower comprises of all the four whorls, that is, calyx, corolla, endrosium, and gynosium. Endrosium is the male reproductive part and includes stamens. Stamens are composed of anther, filament, and connective. Here, I shall not go into the much details. Shall just quickly recollect the terms and proceed. Here you can also see the gynosium, which is the female reproductive part of the flower. It consists of carpels or pistils. The carpel is composed of three parts, namely the stigma, style, and the ovary. Ovary contains the ovule. Besides the primary parts, there are accessory parts as well that provide protection to flowers in the bud stage or help in pollination. These accessory parts primarily include sepals and petals. After the structure of a flower, let's quickly recap the sexual stages in the life cycle of angiosperms that follows alternation of generations. As we have already studied, in angiosperms, the haploid gametophyte alternates with the diploid sporophyte during sexual reproduction. The first structure in the haploid stage is the microspores. The microspores develop into the male gametophyte and are much smaller than the female spore. Pollen is the male gametophyte and develops in the anther. The other potential start of the haploid stage is the megaspore which develops into the female gametophyte or the embryo sac. Once the gametophytes are fully developed, they give rise to male and female gametes. The male gamete is the sperm and the female gamete is the egg cell. The mature male gametophyte, that is the pollen grain, develops into the sperm cell while the mature female gametophyte develops into the egg cell. After the development of male and female gametophyte, let's quickly brush up the basic concepts of pollination that we have already discussed in the previous sessions. Pollination, as we have studied earlier, is basically defined as the transfer of the pollen grains from the anther to the stigma of a flower. The two most common types of pollination primarily include the self-pollination and cross-pollination. Cross-pollination is also called xenogamy, while self-pollination is in turn of two types, autogamy and getinogamy. As the term implies, self-pollination involves transfer of pollen grains from the anther to the stigma of the same flower. If the transfer of pollen grains occurs from the anther to the stigma of the same flower, remember the term same flower, then it is called autogamy. However, if the transfer occurs to a different flower but of the same plant, remember same plant, then it is called getinogamy. After the self-pollination, let's discuss cross-pollination. Cross-pollination refers to the transfer of pollen grains from the anther to the stigma of a different flower of another plant. With this, we come to an end to the revision of our previous lectures and now quickly begin with the next session. In this session, we shall first discuss about double fertilization, products arising as a result of double fertilization and its significance in plant physiology. Let's discuss each aspect one by one in this session. Let's begin with the events of double fertilization. 
Double fertilization is a complex mechanism that has evolved in angiosperms. After pollination, the endine of pollen grain forms the pollen tube through weak areas on exine or the germ pore. The growth of pollen tube is stimulated by the sugary substances produced in stigma. The pollen tube with two male gametes and tube nucleus runs through the style and finally turns towards the micropyle end of the ovule in the cavity of the ovary. The length of pollen tube usually depends on the length of styles. When the pollen tube enters through the micropyle end of the ovule for fertilization, the process is called porogamy. However, in plants like Cassiorina or Betula, pollen tube enters through the embryo sac through the base of the ovule called the chelaza and the process is called chelazogamy. When the pollen tube pierces through the integuments, it is called mesogamy. Remember these few terms. On piercing the nucellus, the pollen tube penetrates the embryo sac. Its tip penetrates in the embryo sac and reaches the egg apparatus passing either between the egg and synergids or between one synergid and wall of the embryo sac. Ultimately, the tip of the pollen tube bursts and two male gametes are discharged. The tube nucleus then disorganizes before bursting of pollen tube. One of these male gametes fuses with the egg cell or oosphere process is called syngamy causing fertilization as a result of which a diploid oospore or a zygote is formed. The other male gamete fuses with the secondary nucleus. This is triple fusion forming the triploid endosperm nucleus which later on gives rise to the endosperm. Thus, the process of fertilization which occurs twice in the same embryo sac at a time by the two male gametes that is the syngamy and the triple fusion is called double fertilization. Here you can see a diploid zygote formed and a triploid primary endosperm nucleus formed as a result of the fusion of the other male gamete with the secondary nucleus. This triploid endosperm nucleus later on gives rise to the endosperm. After discussing the events leading to double fertilization, you must be wondering whether this process confer any advantage to the flowering plants or what is the importance of double fertilization in the life cycle of an angiosperm. So here lies the answer. As a result of double fertilization a diploid zygote is formed which develops into an embryo and that grows into a new plant. Secondly, a triploid primary endosperm nucleus is formed as a result of fusion of the other male gamete with the secondary nucleus. This primary endosperm nucleus develops into the endosperm in the seed that provides nourishment to the growing embryo. In addition, double fertilization also restores the diploid condition by causing fusion of haploid male and female gamete. After describing the events leading to double fertilization, its resulting products and its significance in the plant physiology, let's quickly begin with the post-fertilization structures and events. Here we shall discuss the different post-fertilization structures and events one by one. First, we shall begin with the endosperm. Coming to the endosperm, endosperm development precedes embryo development. The primary endosperm cell divides repeatedly to form a triploid endosperm tissue. The cells of this tissue are filled with reserve food material that provides nourishment to the growing embryo. The most common type of endosperm development involves successive nuclear divisions of the primary endosperm nucleus to form many free nuclei. 
This stage of endosperm development is called free nuclear endosperm. Subsequently, cytokinesis forms membranes and walls between the nuclei and makes the endosperm more solid. One more interesting fact about the endosperm is endosperm may either be completely consumed by the developing embryo before seed maturation as in pea, groundnut, beans or may persist in the mature seed and used up during germination commonly found in castor, coconut etc. After the endosperm, let's begin with the embryo. Embryo is basically a diploid young sporophyte formed as a result of fertilization. Now coming to the stages of the embryo development which is also called embryogeny, embryo develops at the micropylar end of the embryo sac where the zygote is situated. Most zygotes divide only after certain amount of endosperm is formed. This adaptation primarily provides assured nourishment to the developing embryo. Firstly, the zygote gives rise to the proembryo and subsequently forms globular, heart shaped, and mature embryo. Now, let's discuss about the structure of a typical dicot embryo. Typically, a dicot embryo includes an embryonal axis and two cotyledons. Remember, two cotyledons. The portion of the embryonal axis above the level of cotyledons is the epicotyle which terminates with the plumule or the stem tip. While the cylindrical portion below the level of cotyledons is called the hypocotyle that terminates at its lower end in the radical or tip. The root tip is covered with a protective sheath called the root cap. After discussing the structure of a typical dicot embryo, let's move on to the structure of a monocot embryo. Unlike dicot embryos, monocot embryos contain only one cotyledon. In the grass family, the cotyledon is called scutellum and is located laterally to the embryonal axis. At its lower end, the embryonal axis has the radical and root cap enclosed in an undifferentiated sheath called cholurhiza. The portion of the embryonal axis above the level of attachment of scutellum is called the epicotyle. Epicotyle has a shoot apex and a few leaf primordia enclosed in a hollow leaf-like structure called cholioptyle. So with this, we have completed the structure and development of the dicot and monocot embryo. Now let's quickly move on to the next post-fertilization structure formed, the seed. So what is a seed? In angiosperms, seed is the final product of sexual reproduction. It is a fertilized ovule formed inside fruits. Typically, a seed consists of one or two integuments or seed coat, cotyledons and an embryo axis. Mature seeds may be non-albuminous or albuminous. Non-albuminous seeds have no residual endosperm as it is completely consumed during embryo development commonly found in pea or groundnuts. While albuminous seeds retain a part of endosperm as it is not completely used up during embryo development commonly found in maize, wheat, barley, castor, sunflower, etc. In this figure, you can see the structure of some seeds. Integuments of ovules harden as tough protective seed coats also called testa. The seed coat protects the seed from fungi, bacteria or extreme or harsh conditions. The testa has to be split open by the radical before germination can actually proceed. The micropyle remains as a small pore in the seed coat opposite the tip of the radical. The micropyle allows gaseous exchange and entry of water into the seeds during germination. The radical is the embryonic root 
which grows into the root system of the plant while the plumule is the embryonic shoot in it two or more leaves are usually visible with a growing point enclosed between them the cotyledons are leaves attached to the plumule and radical by short stalks and they often contain food reserves which are used during early stages of germination in most plants the cotyledons are brought out of the testa and above the ground where they become green and perform photosynthesis the cotyledons eventually fall off after the first foliage leaves have been formed another distinctly visible structure is the coleoptile and coleoriza the coleoptile is the conical protective sheath which encloses the plumule in a monocot seed while coleoriza is the undifferentiated sheath which encloses the radical and root cap in a monocot seed coleoptile comes out of the soil turns green and performs photosynthesis while coleoriza remains inside the soil and is non green in color these few terms are quite important after discussing the seed its basic structure or the characteristic parts let's discuss the advantages of the seeds thus formed Firstly owing to better dispersal to new habitats seeds help species to colonize in other areas secondly nourishment is also assured to young seedlings until they are capable of performing photosynthesis on their own in addition the tough or hard seed coats provide protection to the embryo also new genetic recombinations are created leading to variations in offsprings after the seed let's start with the structure of a fruit or its basic characteristics fruit is a ripened ovary the wall of the ovary develops into the wall of the fruit called the pericarp when the fruits are developed without fertilization such fruits are called parthenocarpic fruits such fruits are usually seedless interestingly in most plants by the time fruit develops from the ovary other floral parts degenerate and fall off however in a few species such as apple strawberry cashew etc the thalamus also contributes to fruit formation such fruits are called false fruits however most fruits develop only from the ovary and are called true fruits so this is the basic classification of fruits the false fruits and the true fruits till now we have discussed about double fertilization different post fertilization structures like endosperm embryo seed and fruit we have also discussed precisely about the development or the different sequential stages of development of these post fertilization structures so with this here we come to an end of this session of sexual reproduction in flowering plants and in our next session we shall discuss about strategies for enhancement in food production till then goodbye and thank you for watching this video hope to see you again